flow through the earth structures. And the reason I want to do this is that in the sheet pile problem uh, up here, we had a pretty clear understanding of what the total head was on the soil surfaces on both sides all the way through the entirety of the domain. Okay, we know the total head on this line is two meters and the total head on that line is zero meters. So we have boundary conditions over the full width of the domain. All we have to do is construct a flow net to interpolate um, at the points in between. When we come to earth structures, the problem is a little bit different. Okay, we, we don't know the total head boundary condition within part of the uh, earth structure. We know it in some parts, but not in other parts. So um, I'm talking about levees or dams. So here's, here's a problem that illustrates what I'm talking about a little more clearly. Let's say that we have a levee here, and there's some known water elevation on one side of that levee. And let's say that that water elevation is always there, so that we've reached a condition of steady state flow through the levee. And then on the right side, we know that the water table is right at the ground surface elevation. Well, we don't know the total head in, in the, this region here because we, we don't know the position of the phreatic surface, right? We have to come up with that and figure out where it is. Uh, it might be tempting to say that we do know the total head all along this line, that it's just equal to, um, to, to zero or whatever, depending on where your datum is, you know, whatever value you calculate there. But the problem is that the water may not actually be up there. It's going to flow through the center of the levee in some way. And uh, so we have to try and estimate the position of where that water is flowing before we can solve this problem. So I just wanted to show you how to do that. Once we have that surface, then drawing the flow net is fairly easy. Arguably, it's easier than for the sheet pile problem. So the way that we'll start is to first identify surfaces where we have a known total head. So we do know the total head along the soil surface right there and right here because we're assuming that the water table is hydrostatic. We know the elevation head at all of those points and we know the pressure head at all of those points and then the total head is going to be constant. So um, basically this one right here, this is an equipotential line. I'm going to draw it in green, right? So this is an equipotential line. All right, an EQ pop line. Okay, and then, of course, uh, this is also an equipotential line, and the, that line happens to have the same total head. Then we have another equipotential line over here because we know the total head and elevation, uh, we know the elevation head and pressure head along that surface. So, um, what I'm going to do now is try and draw the top flow line. And that top flow line is going to bound the water surface, right? That's going to be like the zero pressure um, line. Now, what we know about flow lines and equipotential lines, whoops, is that they have to be perpendicular to each other. So I know that the flow line is going to have to start out at an angle like that. That's a right angle, right? The, uh, flow line and the equipotential line have to intersect at a right angle. Um, and then it's going to have to catch up somehow with this point down there, right? So um, what I'm going to do is kind of sketch it. Now it's got to curve this way and come down and maybe go like that uh, and join up with that equipotential line. Things get a little more complicated here. Technically, it does have to be perpendicular to this equipotential line too. So it's got to, you know, it's hard to let me erase this and come zoom in here and show you what I mean. Uh, can I erase just that green line? Yes. Okay, so here's the equipotential line. The flow line has to start vertical here because the equipotential line is horizontal. So um, we know that this one's going to start out at that angle and end up, end up vertical. So uh, it's got to have this sort of double curvature arc to it in order to facilitate that. Okay, so now we've got the, um, the equipotential line, and the, well, we have our first flow line, right? This is, um, the, we'll call it the first flow line. 
And now all we need to do is sketch in some more flow lines that go kind of along that same pathway. And I'll draw one here. Again, it has to be perpendicular. And then it's going to come like this. Get smaller as we go. Then I'll draw another one here. Maybe we'll just have um, three flow lines. We've got to make that one a little higher up. Oops, sketch that back in. Okay, so I'm going to put it right there. Like that. All right, and now we'll sketch our equal potential lines. I'll make the, uh, I should have made the flow lines in a different color. Um, here, I'm going to. I'm going to draw the uh, equal potential lines in red. Like that. Uh, okay. Now we'll draw the other equal potential lines. We need to fit a circle. So what you can even do is come and draw a circle right in there, and a circle right here. You can kind of see now that the equal potential line has to go like this. And then we'll have another one right here. Oh, not tangent. Anyway, right there. Now the next one has to go like that. And you can kind of see how this is going. They're going to get closer together as we go. Like this. There's one. So you just keep drawing them. And then they get pretty vertical here. And then they start getting curved again. surface. Then when you get to the toe, they become very close together. So um, what happens there at the toe, happen, it turns out to be really crucial. Okay, one of the questions is whether the water exiting at this location is going to cause erosion of the toe of the levee, and you might start losing soil this way, right? It's going to flow out, and then you get a pipe that works its way back, and eventually the levee would fail from that. So, unfortunately, flow net is not a great way to get that because you can see that it's really difficult. I didn't draw the flow net very well at all. I have the two flow lines actually touching right there. It's just not easy to get an accurate flow net down in that region. So, uh, anyway, that's a crucial thing. You can get, of course, the, um, the total flow rate through this levee pretty well. If, if that's what you're concerned about, it's more like how much water is going to flow through the levee. You're not worried about its stability. Then you can use the flow net pretty accurately. Uh, and then maybe we would have, you know, one more line just along the, one more flow line here along the bottom of the levee. And then um, that's the complete flow net. Now, we're not worried about under seepage. In reality, there would be some water going underneath, too. So um, this is a problem that's much better suited for a finite element seepage analysis, which um, is kind of the, the industry standard for how we do seepage analysis. These days, but it is good to know how to draw that phreatic surface and get a flow net. Um, let's talk about a mitigation strategy or two different mitigation strategies. Let's say you're worried about water. Whoops, didn't mean to use that tool. I'm going to use this one. You're worried about water exiting through the, uh, the downstream toe of the levee and eroding it. Well, there are two different strategies that you might use here to prevent that from happening. Uh, one of them would be well, both of them would control the seepage in some way. Um, one of them would be to install a tow drain. So let's say that you come in to, as you're building the levee, you put a pipe in here. Right? That pipe is going to be open. It will allow water to infiltrate in. It'll have some kind of filter fabric around it so that the soil particles don't flow into that pipe. Um, well, now you've created a condition where you're preventing water from exiting through the um, face of the levee, through the downstream face, which will enhance its stability. So your phreatic surface now has to come to this point. Maybe it'll be vertical there, perpendicular there, so it's going to look like this. And then, you know, you'll have, um, I should stick with consistent colors here. Okay. 
space down there because you've got you're going through that pipe. So that's a good way to improve stability. When you label the toe drain. There we go. But um, one thing I'll point out is you're going to get a lot more flow now going through your levee because you have the same total head drop, right? It's going to be two, you know, however many meters that height is right there. Uh, but all of that drop is happening over a shorter distance. So basically, you're going to have fewer equipotential lines in this flow net than you have in this flow net. So there's more uh, head loss per equipotential line, therefore higher flow through each cell. And so the, the tow drain is going to speed up flow of water through the levee. At, you know, so that's a downside. Usually we want levees to hold back as much water as possible. Um, but it is going to improve the stability, so you're not going to get a piping failure or a slope failure on that downstream um, tow anymore. Uh, similarly, you could lower this water table, right? Like if you put a pump here on the downstream side to move the water table down, that would also potentially move the water surface so it doesn't exit through the downstream face of the levee. Okay, another mitigation strategy. Let me label these as mitigation strategies here. Okay, another mitigation strategy is to um, control the amount of flow that's going through the levee by putting a low permeability barrier. Uh, and that's generally how we tend to build earth dams. So we have now this same general geometry of earth structure. But instead of trying to drain water out, we're going to put a low permeability barrier in the middle to try and prevent it from seeping through in the first place. Um, and the way that we would do that is by constructing a low permeability core. And uh, let me draw that in red. So maybe in the middle, as we're building the dam, we would put a clay core. And then uh, a lot of the time we have to build that clay core fairly deep. So let's say you're building a dam and then the rock interface is down here, right? So this is like intact rock, um, not permeable. Well, you would want to build that clay core probably all the way down. Maybe you would compact it like this, you know, something like that. So you've got this, this cutoff wall, basically. So water can no longer just flow freely through the clay. And then when we build this sort of structure, we usually put some sort of sand or gravel, a granular shell here. So the shell provides strength and stability because the clay in the core gen generally tends to be pretty weak. Um, the shell provides that strength. The clay provides that cutoff for controlling hydraulic conductivity or controlling flow. All right, now this is a complicated one because we no longer have a uniform hydraulic conductivity. Okay, when we've been sketching our flow net so far, we've assumed by making all of the cells square, we're assuming the hydraulic conductivity is constant. So uh, usually what we'll do is recognize that the vast majority of the head loss is going to happen here in the clay because the granular shell has a really high permeability compared to the clay, probably many orders of magnitude, four or five orders of magnitude lower. So uh, what we can do is um, cheat a little bit and just assume that nothing happens in the shell and the water comes straight across to the clay and then all the head loss is going to happen inside of that uh, granular shell. Um, I'm going to move that a little bit here. Maybe I'll move it up here and just label it so that I can sketch the water surface. So here's the water surface coming straight across. Okay, so that's basically assuming no head loss in the shell. Then uh, I'm going to have to move this one too. Move it down there. Um, okay, now what we can do is kind of zoom in, and I'm going to sketch the uh, flow lines going through this flow net here. It's got to be, again, perpendicular. So now we're, we're sketching a flow net that only goes through that core, and it may look like this, and then you've got your equipotential lines like that, and you've, you've 
sketch your flow that you can compute flow rate and everything going through the um, the clay core. So uh, anyway, that's a those are two different mitigation strategies for kind of controlling flow through earth structures, and uh, there is some judgment involved in getting that top um, flow line, also called the phreatic surface. Uh, but you know, it's not that difficult to sketch it in. Once you have it sketched in, it's pretty easy to sketch that flow net to go along.